Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Landrum. I'm the president and CEO of the Alexandria Economic Development Partnership, and we are delighted to have um, a, a strong number of our neighbors here tonight to join us for our first Alexandria listening session related to the monumental ALX project. On the next slide, you'll see tonight is the first of four sessions that we have structured to be able to talk through on a topic basis some of the most frequently asked questions around parts of this opportunity. Um, with me tonight are City Manager Jim Perijan and Monica Dixon representing Monumental Sports and Entertainment. She's the President, External Affairs and Chief Administrative Officer. They're here to listen to our um, conversation and I'll let them both introduce themselves and say hello. Jim, would you like to go first? Yes, first of all, I'm Jim Perry, John, the city manager. I'm real excited and I appreciate uh, our residents time tonight to uh, uh, provide us with uh, some information about uh, uh, this wonderful project uh, that uh, is yeah. under consideration. So thank you. And good evening, everyone. I'm Monica Dixon from Monumental Sports, and I will echo Jim's comments that uh, we couldn't be more thrilled that you have chosen to give an hour of what I'm sure is a very busy schedule in your life to this uh, session, and we're uh, very excited to listen and to learn. So let's talk a little bit about how the session is going to, to work. <clears throat> We're going to start it by an introduction of who the experts are. So each week you will see Jim and Monica here uh, listening, but there will be a different set of panelists based on the topics uh, available to answer questions. <clears throat> we'll start each presentation or each session with a, a brief presentation with some level setting information around the topic. So a few slides, and then we'll go right to questions and answers. Many of you have already submitted questions through uh, our, there's a, a link on the monumentalalx.com website and uh, have found, found other ways to submit questions, whether it be through existing city website um, opportunities or on social media. So we've collected a lot of those questions and we'll start tonight with those. We also have the opportunity here through the Zoom for you to enter live questions in a Q&A uh, function. So please feel free to do that as we proceed. If you have a question that's not being answered or a topic um, related to economic and, and finance that hasn't been covered. Because we have an hour, it's possible that we won't get to every question. And so we want you all to know that we will be capturing every single question asked and we will compile those and provide written answers to every question uh, to include the ones that we answer here live tonight. And then we'll make that information available to everyone who's attended. And we will also post it on the monumentalalx.com website afterwards. And so with that, let's proceed to talking through who's here tonight to answer questions. Uh, our panel includes Alexandria City staff who work in finance and uh, advisors who the city has used for many decades. So I'll start with City of Alexandria Interim Deputy City Manager and our Director of Finance, Kendall Taylor. Hi, I'm Kendall Taylor. I'm the Director of Finance for the City of Alexandria. I've been the Director uh, for almost 10 years and I am currently serving as one of the Interim Deputy City Managers um, over the Finance Department, the Budget Office and the Department of Community and Human Services. Next up, Jimmy Sanderson. Uh Good evening. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Jimmy Sanderson uh, I'm with Davenport and Company. I've got my colleague Ty Welford uh, here as well. I'll let him introduce himself in a moment. Uh, we are the financial advisor to uh, the city of Alexandria, or another term as a municipal advisor. Uh, we uh, work with Kindle in particular, uh, assisting the, the city um, in funding their, their capital program, so their CIP. Um, I have been working with uh, the city uh, since I started at Davenport almost uh, 17, 18 years ago. Um, uh, so I have a long history of working with them on their just their general CIP, but also economic development projects um, throughout the city. Uh, we, we act as financial advisors in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, uh, we've been in business for, for 20 plus years uh, as, as municipal advisors. Um, prior to my joining Davenport, I was a, a bond lawyer uh, with a firm called Hunt and Williams. Um, and so I've got a little bit of background on the legal side as well as the finance side here. So I'll let Ty uh, introduce himself as well. Yep. Thank you, Jimmy. Ty Welford uh, with Davenport & Company, Senior Vice President 
<clears throat> I've been with the company for 17 years now. I uh, work with Jimmy on a number of engagements, uh, including serving as financial advisor to the city of Alexandria and excited to be here. Thanks. Excellent. So let's jump into the few sort of level setting slides. Let's talk a little bit about how we got here, why the city um, is, is even considering an economic development project. One of the um, initiative or one of the issues that council talks about on a very regular basis, and certainly as they go through their strategic priorities as they take office, is economic development and the desire for growth. And so we do have some guiding principles that my office and the city manager and city staff team use when we are sourcing and looking for opportunities. And so I wanted to start tonight's conversation with this as sort of background. We are in, instructed to make sure that we are always keeping in mind the city's debt, um, debt capacity and uh, bond rating. And that's why our advisors here are have been with us for so long and um, I think is a testament to the work that they've done. We also are always looking at opportunities that will help us enhance growing that debt capacity. So the more revenue that we're able to bring in as a city, the more capacity we have to take on projects of importance uh, in our capital improvement program. Over the last 20 years, the city has really followed a successful invest in catalyst uh, approach. And the next slide that um, when I get to it, I'll, I'll show you a couple of those examples that should look very familiar to our, our community. We also uh, make sure that when we're looking at projects that they generate new revenue throughout the life of the project. Um, we're looking for long-term economic growth and not just short stints or, or quick, um, quick hits of, of new economic development and revenue. We also look to leverage new revenue that's generated by the project if we need to provide an incentive. And so we're not in a position where we're taking money away from existing commitments or programs. We find ways to structure an investment where we're actually using the new revenue that would be generated by the project. And then the last two, the chart that's on this on this slide speaks to these two items. Many years ago, there was a, a very significant strategic effort done by the city called economic sustainability. And one of the main takeaways from that, that exercise, which was a, a citizen led group of, um, of, of people who made recommendations to the city about how to grow, was that we really needed to focus on diversifying our tax base, that we are way too reliant on residential tax um, real estate tax, which is what this chart shows, and that we need to find ways to, uh, to significantly grow our commercial tax base. So those are the principles under which we kind of source economic development projects. The next slide is uh, some, some examples of the catalyst approach that we have used. We uh, have done projects from the Virginia Tech Innovation Campus to the redevelopment of Landmark Mall, and uh, recruiting uh, major office campuses like the United States Patent and Trademark Office and the National Science Foundation, all of which have catalyzed a significant amount of investment around the initial project. As we looked uh, certainly over these last few years about how do we continue to follow this same pattern, one of the new things that we have been talking a lot about is finding commercial uses that are viable in a post-pandemic world. Office had been a key part of our strategy for many decades, and some of these projects here on the slide are office-based. But in a post-pandemic world, office is no longer sort of the strong, stable commercial use because the way that we all use office has changed. And so thinking through what uses actually still prioritize in-person gathering and things like sports and entertainment, medical, education fall into that category. And so we have been looking for projects that 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 fit that bill. Uh, again, something that's different than it was maybe just five years ago. Every time we consider a catalyst project, we do a fiscal and economic evaluation where we compare the base case of either what exists today or what is likely to exist without intervention versus the opportunity. And then we also look at market realities and trends. We compare those opportunities and that's part of what we then present to the community and to city council for evaluation as to whether or not a project is, um, is something that we should focus on. And so that's where we are and that's what tonight's session is about is taking the results of this practice that we have been doing for many years and talking, talking through the findings. We also uh, only make investments when inducement makes the project possible. And so what that means is that when we're working with a, with a company or an investment or a, a partner, we need to understand 
why they can't do this on their own without participation from, um, from the local government. And then finally, we really are always looking to do uh, deals with as many partners as possible. In this instance, we're talking about a partnership, not just with Monumental Sports, but with the Commonwealth of Virginia and with a development entity. And we're finding ways to invest in the project, but also invest in the community alongside it. So um, I think most people have uh, have heard or know that we ADP contracted HRNA advisors to do an economic and fiscal impact analysis. Again, a standard part of, um, of how we evaluate opportunities to compare this opportunity to bring an entertainment and sports complex and district to Potomac Yard. <clears throat> and so these are the these are the top line results. The uh, a portion of the of the study and an overview memo of the study is available on the website, and we are uh, going to be answering some questions about it tonight. But this project contributes direct revenue to both our community here in Alexandria, the Commonwealth, and really because of its size and scale, the region. And so these are um, these are sort of the top line numbers here: four point nine billion in economic impact for the city. Uh, $31 million in new education funding. This It's a, a core part of the project that we um, have studied is what are the community benefits and revenues that will be available to the city to use for other um, important initiatives and a significant amount of investment in new transportation and transit, um, both in the project area, but also in, in the surrounding region. So the next, um, the next two slides, I wanna just again, level set, what was the base case that we are comparing this opportunity to? And so you see here a picture, it's a little bit dated, um, but in some ways it's pretty much still what, what the site looks like. It's a shopping center that was built um, almost 20 years ago. And it was built at the time to be a temporary use while we figured out how and if we were going to build a metro station. And we planned as a community for what then sort of development we would like to see around that metro station. And so we're coming to the end of that 20 year initial term. And unfortunately, because of the market, because of the pandemic, and because commercial uses, um, traditional commercial uses really are not that viable, the base case that we are comparing this opportunity to is a scenario where this shopping center stays as is for the next 20 years. And that's not projection, that is actually based on existing obligations and lease negotiations that are in place. And so that is the real kind of what we're comparing this opportunity to is real estate tax revenue growing at about 2% each year uh, as is, and sales tax revenue pretty much remaining consistent. We're able to look at how much revenue has been generated by this site over the, over the, the course of the last 20 years. And so that is real data then for us to, to grow marginally, but to say, this is what happens with no intervention. The existing parking lot would, would stay as is, um, we would potentially get some, some new residential building on the site that was the movie theater once the market recovers. And so we probably would not see that until about 10 years from now. And so those were the inputs that our advisor used to establish the base case. And we're comparing that then to the entertainment district case, which is very different, obviously. Um, it brings to bear a number of assets in the red area as the arena phase and phase one to include an arena, a performance venue, a uh, office building, headquarters for Monumental, a Wizards uh, basketball team, NBA practice facility. But then it also catalyzes hotels, residential, and another private office building in just phase one. And so these are the inputs then that were put into the economic analysis to create this, um, this base case versus opportunity case. Um, another big top line number is the number of jobs that this this entertainment district would uh, would create. And I know there's been um, there's been lots of talk about these numbers. And so I want to make sure I'm clear that the the um, the number of jobs that would be created in the Commonwealth for permanent jobs. So everybody um, working at the facility that we're talking about, but also to be working at the other facilities and and follow on development that will happen 
as well as development that will start to happen as you sort of concentrically move away from this catalyst impact. So there will be new jobs that are created in Arlington. There will be jobs created throughout the Commonwealth to, um, to service a lot of the businesses here. So think about professional plumbers and HVAC and, um, and all of the, you know, kind of specialties that are required to, to maintain buildings. They won't necessarily be jobs right here in Alexandria, but the impact will grow throughout the Commonwealth. And so that number is 30,000 jobs as a result of this, um, this uh, catalyst. In addition, there will be 17,000 <clears> uh, temporary jobs. So while the entire district is built out over the course of, of a 10 to 15 year period, there will be 17,000 construction jobs uh, created on site. And so those numbers are, are very significant. And you see here compared to the base case, um, they are an order of magnitude, uh, very, very significant. Again, it's, it's another input that we consider as we evaluate whether or not to pursue an opportunity. The last, um, I, I think I have about two, two slides and then we'll get to the Q&A, um, but just wanna make sure that everyone sort of understands the way that this deal has been structured so that the questions you know, about this can, um, can be appropriately um, submitted. We are proposing uh, as the city and the Commonwealth to create a authority, a sports and arena authority who would purchase the land and build the facilities in the arena section. So it was the red section on that map. And the way that we would uh, mostly finance that is by issuing bonds. And the reason, if you, if you go back then to some of our kind of guiding principles for how we do these projects, the reason this is an attractive structure is because the city and the Commonwealth are both um, highly rated um, um, government entities. And so their ability, our collective ability to access capital costs a lot less than it does in the private market. And so we are able to use our rating and our kind of um, credentials as creating this new authority to issue bonds at this lower cost of capital, but we've structured it so that the bonds would be paid back by lease payments made to the authority by Monumental and a collection of incremental revenues generated on site. Some of those are taxes, but the majority of them are actually direct payments for parking, for naming rights, um, and I'm forgetting what the third one is right now, um, and, but I'm sure one of my friends will save me. Admissions. Admissions tax. Thank you very much. Um, new revenue. So uh, revenue, uh, direct payments that are really paid by people using the site. Um, and so those are, that is how the public side of the structure is mostly kind of handled. The other thing though on this chart that we'll talk a little bit about is the city did see an opportunity to do something unique uh, on site by bringing to bear a performance venue and is proposing that we would spend $106 million of, um, of either leftover monies that we have at the end of our regular years. And, and I'm sure that our finance director can, can talk a little bit about this as well as um, potentially savings in our, our capital improvement program because projects naturally sort of get delayed. But the way that we're structuring that part of our investment is that we would own the asset and there and it is very much aligned with, with things that we're doing in other parts of the city to bring arts, culture, um, and community gathering spaces uh, into our new neighborhoods um, and our existing neighborhoods. And then the last piece, which is not insignificant, um, it is uh, over $400 million of direct investment from the company themselves. Um, so that is the way that we call it the capital stack, how you pay for this whole project that costs $2 billion. And I'm sure that um, I know that a lot of the questions will be about, um, about the structure and some of the risks or perceived risks with the structure. Um, I'll, uh, I did put a slide in here about our joint venture for the performance venue, but I just explained that if we have questions about this, we can come back to this slide. Um, and then this slide is um, a little bit difficult, difficult to read, um, even I think for the most uh, sophisticated financial person, um, of which we have many here. Um, but what this slide is intended to show is that Phase one, which is uh, the arena and the performance venue and some of the, the, the ancillary uh, buildings that we'd like to see that will be catalyzed uh, across the street. Phase one will generate $7.5 billion of economic impact. And this top line here um, of the blue shows that only it looks on here about a, a quarter of the phase one 
economic impact will be required to pay the debt, which is the gray box over here, the authority debt and debt service costs. The rest of the revenue and impact generated by phase one goes directly then to the Commonwealth and the city is split between the two. Um, and that's just sort of the very simple way to process this chart. The, the last thing that I'll say about this chart, and we can get into specifics if you have, um, as we get questions, is that phases two and three are not required at all to serve it, uh, to service the debt. All of that is net new revenue and impact for the city and the Commonwealth. And so that really is the definition of catalyst. The catalyst pays for itself. It creates net new revenue and resources for the people who catalyzed it. But then it really does then have a whole second set, whether it's phase two, phase three, or the combination that are just net, net positive to the people who have catalyzed, in this case, the city and the Commonwealth. The last um, slide, and then we'll get right to your questions, is this is the kind of um, <clears throat> top line takeaway then from the economic impact uh, studies and analysis and, and um, help from our advisors here. So what you see on the left is the baseline development without the arena. And you see that the impact is, um, is really, um, it, 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 it's great. Um, it, all growth is good for, for the city and for the Commonwealth, but this project and the opportunity is um, a significant multiple greater. And so that's the, that's the chart on the right, that with the arena and the subsequent phases, we would see $12 billion worth of econ economic impact versus 2.8. And so this is what, again, what we use when we do these studies, we bring this, this information forward and it is part of the discussion at the community and city council level. And so um, with that, we'll kind of pause on this picture and we'll start to get to your questions. They have been coming in, so we appreciate that. I'll sort of start with um, um, one of the, you know, one of the questions that we've been getting just sort of baseline is, um, can you sort of explain in just sort of common language what is being asked of the city uh, to, to finance and structure this project? Right, right. Hey, Stephanie, it's, uh, Jimmy, and I'll I'll take that one. Um, you know, when, when looking at it just at its fundamental level, there's there's really three things that um, the city's being asked to do, and and Stephanie hit on it earlier, but in particular, it's to pledge new what we call site specific revenues. Maybe we'll probably get into a little bit of that later with some questions, but site site-specific new revenues um, that are going to be produced because of the project and ultimately pledged to the repayment of debt. Um, Stephanie hit on a little bit as well related to um, one of the pieces of debt, which is um, going to be repaid from those those specific site uh, revenues. We're going to put our contingent moral obligation behind it, along with the state. Um, that allows us to. Uh, get a credit rating that's much higher, borrow at lower interest rates, ultimately allowing more excess revenues to flow back to the Commonwealth and the city of Alexandria. And the last piece relates to the lease revenue bonds um, that, again, are going to be issued by that, that sports and entertainment authority um, that are going to be backed by the lease revenue payments um, of Monumental, but the state um, and uh, Alexandria are putting their um, uh, credit enhancement behind that as well in order to, to get those ratings higher again, borrow at lower rates, and therefore be able to generate more, uh, more proceeds to finance the project. So um, one of the, a lot of questions we're getting are around uh, what revenue specifically will be used to repay the debt. Um, and, and I gave sort of a, a top line, but it, uh, if, if one or, or a number of you could give some more details to give people the idea of what, what revenues are being pledged. And I guess the flip of that is what revenues are not being pledged um, and will be, will be maintained by the city or the state. So the, the, the revenues that we're going to use uh, to repay the debt, I think in particular, um, are going to be the, uh, the admissions tax for people using the arena. Um, you've got the parking revenues that are going to be associated with that, with the parking, um, parking decks as well. And then you have naming rights. Those revenues, um, based on the, the projections that we have, are, are more than sufficient to repay the debt um, that, that that's going to be put um, on the on the project. 
Um, in addition to that, though, in order to, to get the, the higher, uh, higher rating and get lower interest rates, we have pledged other site-specific revenues. Um, those are going to include property taxes, hotel, hotel taxes, meal taxes, but only again within the sports and entertainment district that we've defined. So they're not um, they're not taking revenues or taxes that are in other parts of the city that are currently uh, currently being used to to pay just the general fund operations um, of the city. So I think the the important thing is that again they're they're, they're site specific new revenues to the city, um, and they they don't exist without the project itself, and in particular the um, the what I'll call the arena specific revenues are, are modeled to be sufficient to pay the debt service uh, by themselves. Yeah. So, Jimmy, Jimmy, I would just add too to connect the dots on the pie chart that Stephanie had up. That that's what was labeled as the the private revenues under the <clears throat> under the project revenue bonds, the thirty percent private revenue streams. That's the those specific ticket tax, sorry, admissions, parking naming rights that you had just hit on. And, the, and maybe before Kendall, you, you touch on sort of what's, maybe you can hit on what's not included. Um, but again, the, the site specific revenues, um, again, those are things that that are over and above what we're currently collecting at the, at the site. Um, very common when we, when we fund these types of projects that are revenue, revenue based projects. One of the things that we that will talk about is, is coverage and debt service coverage and that is how much greater are these these projected revenues than the projected debt service i think again one of the things that's important to note is that at a minimum one of the things that the city looked at was in the state that we wanted to have at least two times coverage of our our debt service versus our revenues that we're bringing in so the revenues um, on any any annual basis um, are in excess of two times um, the level of the annual debt service in that year. So that's that's important when we think about um, if if there are dips or our projections um, are less in one year than another, we've got that coverage additional revenue to offset any any decline um, uh, and, and still be able to pay our debt service. Kendall, can you can you talk to us a little bit about revenues on site that are not being pledged and and um, and why? <laughs> yeah, I want to also just uh, stress that no current revenues that are being generated, collected, taxed in the city are are going to be uh, directed toward this. Um, and also, there are there are certain site specific revenues that are. Um, designated for another purpose. So stormwater management, the Potomac Yard Special Tax District, that is not going to fund this project. That already has a, a stated purpose. And so those, even though they're site specific, those aren't going to be part of backing these um, these debts. Um, so uh, we're, we're getting some questions and we had this question before as well. Um, uh, people want to understand how, uh, well, one, if this is owned by a state authority, is is will they be paying real estate taxes? And yeah, this is Jimmy. Uh, yeah, again, no. I, my understanding is that the the arena, as owned by um, the Commonwealth, would not pay future real estate taxes. And we, and and again, we haven't taken that into account um, in in order to pay repay the debt either. And so I think. Um, not not to not to editorialize, but I think one of the one of the questions is, you know, we talk a lot about how real estate tax uh, pay, you know, is such a great revenue source for us, and so there is a concern that if it's not paying revenue, to, uh, real estate tax, um, how could this be profitable? And so I think, as you all are, are explaining, the amount of use taxes generated by a facility like this. Um, it, it's hard to imagine another use that that generates as much um, use tax because um, we, not only is it creating admissions tax just to get in the door, someone's going to have to pay a tax to, to buy that ticket, but then when they get in the door, they will be buying things that we also tax, uh, whether it's meals, whether it's merchandise, um, and then if they... Um, <clears throat> 
if they then go go out afterwards, et cetera, it, the, the use taxes are, are so significant that they actually are much greater than the real estate tax that we would collect on this site. And so. Stephanie, it's important that the, the development around that, um, and especially in the subsequent phases, will absolutely be taxable. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, uh, there are some questions uh, of, around kind of protections. And Jimmy, you just talked a little bit about the way that the deal was structured um, to provide a cushion for, um, you know, to protect on those uh, projections. Is there, um, uh, could, could you give us some examples? I know I have said, and I, I think people are hearing this a lot, that we uh, as, a, as a team looked at a lot of other deals to understand maybe where there have been shortfalls or where other communities have made mistakes. Can you tell us about any of the learnings that we have incorporated into the structure of this particular deal? Sure, I think I think um, the first the first step was your engagement of an outside consultant to come in and and look at what these projected revenues are going to be. Um, you know, they're they're oftentimes on economic development projects. Um, local governments can rely on what the what the developers are coming and showing them as what the the potentials are going to be. In this case, you engaged a, a third party um, entity who who was um, working on behalf of the of the um, of the city um, to look at those what those revenue estimates may be. Um, and certainly, we all had a chance to look look through them and make sure that they weren't um, weren't overly aggressive. But you know, using conservative revenue estimates is important um, uh, from the very beginning. Um, and again, we we only want to look at site specific revenues has, has sort of been the mantra of the of the team in, in reviewing this 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 project, as opposed to some others that have looked at um, uh, locality wide taxes. So um, in, instead of of looking at hotel tax across the entire um, the entire city, we've only been focusing specifically on uh, on this on this one entertainment entertainment district. Um, I think a couple other things um, uh, when we talk about it there, the structure that we're looking at is a, a senior and a subordinate piece. Um, we, we noted that Alexandria and the Commonwealth are going to um, put their contingent moral obligation behind approximately $350 million each on that debt. That's not all of the, uh, the debt that'll be issued, that'll be secured by the tax revenues. Um, there is a, there's a senior piece that will be um, uh, we'll have no backing by the by the by the city and the state, but the revenue, the coverage levels at that at, on that piece are much greater, um, four to six times coverage, meaning the revenues are four to six times the the debt service on that piece, uh, and the smaller piece um, that we're we're backing um, uh, with the contingent moral obligation um, is again a minimum of two times coverage is something we're looking for. So we we certainly didn't structure from the beginning to be. Uh, close on those on those coverage levels. If you were at again one times coverage, it would take just a little bit of movement in in what your projected revenues may be. Um, but in this case, we're at, we're we're uh, at least have fifty percent of our revenues could go down, and we could still cover uh, cover our our debt uh, debt service without calling on that contingent moral obligation of the city or um, the state. One one other thing I'll mention too. Um, even before that may happen, there are reserves in place. Um, so there's there'll be a minimum of, of I think one plus year of debt service that will be held in a reserve. Um, if there are any instances where um, there is a you know, interruption of, uh, of activities, um, so we've got some uh, some reserves that are going to be in place from day one uh, to um, uh, to pay any any debt service if revenues were to be uh, insufficient. And the last thing is um, the both, both the city, the Commonwealth, and Monumental have had conversations about making sure that we are are funding capital reserves uh, as well that that will be available to make sure that the facility uh, is is well maintained going forward. Great. That um, so two two kind of follow up questions on those topics. The the last point there that you made the the capital investments. So there have been a number of questions. Where uh, where people are concerned, they see that uh, sports teams at the end of a term pick up and leave and go somewhere else because the facility um, or 
partway through their term, um, decide that they need lots of new investments and upgrades, and they come back to the jurisdiction and ask for money. Um, can you can you um, explain a little bit about the reserve fund and why, how the reserve fund is structured to prevent those two scenarios from happening? Yeah, I think the I think that just the 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 commitment from the very beginning by the Commonwealth, the city, and and monumental monumental to understand that you know we have to set aside revenues in this in this uh, stream of of money. So uh, the numbers that we've been talking about all include. Um, the, the the funding of that of that capital reserve um, really from from day one and it's not a stagnant number is what we're we're hoping for either it's going to be a number that that grows over time so it, it's going to be growing with in, uh, inflation as well um, so that at the end of the term you won't have a situation where um, there are large um, large capital needs that that may be necessary uh, but those those capital maintenance uh, requirements would be taken care of. You know, as you go through, and so at the end of that thirty-plus uh, year uh, lease, you would still have a facility um, that isn't isn't in disrepair or dilapidated, but but is still at a standard that um, that Monumental would want to continue to to to, uh, to play uh, and operate there. Um, so maybe maybe Kendall can answer this. This is kind of the second follow up question. Is um, people are, I think, are, are understanding now that what two times coverage means, and and so that on any given year, there's going to be there's going to be more money than we need to pay the debt. Um, Kendall, what happens to then that that extra money um, at the end of the year, or 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 Jimmy or Ty? Um, and because I know what the answer is, um, then who decides how that money gets spent? So on the city side, that is money available for programs, services, additional capital projects. And we have a, a budget process that involves the community and a, a tax rate process that uh, how we tax our community. And so we decide how that money is being spent. We as a community, um, as a city council, the manager, it is a it is a discussion that everyone is familiar with. And so every, every year, maybe to clarify this, every year that the facility performs at least 50% of our projections, 50% or more, there will be money left over that the city then receives and goes to the general fund. The general fund or the capital fund. That's correct. And, and maybe, um, Stephanie, maybe Stephanie to add to, this, this isn't a, a concept that Alexandria hasn't used in the past either, right? So, um, and you know it better than, than anyone, but um, the, the the metro station project that uh, that you all took on, um, it, one it's it it is I suspect a catalyst to uh, being able to even do this project, um, having that that there. But um, you know we we borrowed a, a significant amount of money to build that uh, metro uh, station stop, um, and it was a commitment that we looked at. Uh, and one making sure that it wasn't going to again hurt our our rating, but it was a large large capital um, improvement uh, that the city took on. But the goal there was, and I think it's it's played to fruition, is that um, it, the area would pay for that debt, and, and, and it is, and that it, it also contributes to the, the city's general fund dollars that, that really wouldn't otherwise be, be available and, and can be used as city council and, and the city residents uh, determined to, to use throughout the, the other parts of the city. Yeah, Jimmy, uh, basically annually, the Potomac Yard Fund the past several years contributes about $6 million to the general fund that's above and beyond the cost of funding the debt for the metro station. Kendall, let's, can we um, ask you some questions about um, how the city would pay for uh, a cash contribution to build this performance venue? There have been some questions about where would that money come from? Is this existing uh, money that taxpayers are going to have to pay? Um, are we going to see a line item in budgets coming up um, to fund the, uh, the ability for us to bring a performance venue to this complex? So that is not anticipated. You touched on it before. We have fund balance that we have been using toward our capital projects over the past several years. I think we put about 20 million a year. We also have fund balance that we set aside for economic development issues. So uh, both of those would be a source as well as you touched on earlier. 
in the in the CIP, we have we have plans in place. It's basically a 10 year program, but the projects don't necessarily come online uh, when we are anticipating them. So we're likely to shuffle some things around, knowing we're going to be kind of paying ourselves back down the line. And so we will we will shuffle around and look at fund balance and basically look at existing sources and projects to be able to fund something that you touched on it earlier, that economic sustainability idea is to have an experience-based um, entity, a performance venue. So it's a it would be a capital project investment that actually generates more revenue, which is unique for our CIP. We invest in a lot of things, whether it's rec centers, um, infrastructure, schools, but this would be an investment in a capital project that actually generates revenue as well. It's another kind of theme of questions that I'm getting, which I think you just started to answer a little bit, Kendall, is um, a lot of people have read about stadium projects around the country that just don't pan out. They don't have the economic impact, the catalytic impact. Um, and so one of the things that is, uh, we keep saying that this deal is very different because it's more than just an arena. Um, can anyone sort of talk a little bit and, and uh, explain why we think that uh, that this deal is structured differently and that it really um, it is not comparable to building a stadium with surface parking um, in a, in a non-transit area um, and that the kind of the finances of those two things and the expected economic impact is very different? I'll start. One is the there's a there's variety here. Um, you've got you've got sports. You're going to have open space. You'll have restaurants. You'll have gathering. Somebody in the community recently said something that I thought was really important. When you lift the the water, all the boats rise. So if we've got something that is bringing people into Alexandria um, to eat at our restaurants, to stay in our hotels, that is. Um, those are dollars coming in that are not coming from our residential homeowner. They're not coming from our existing residents. And I think that's important for the entire uh, business community. And, and I guess maybe I'll add to that, Stephanie, the, the go back to the, um, to the, the capital stack that you described. Um, you know, again, this is, this is a partnership between us, the Commonwealth, and um, the private sector, um, both both monumental and and the developers of the uh, what we're calling phase one. So um, the the contribution of monumental is is no small amount. Um, there's a large large cash contribution as well as an agreement to a long term uh, long term lease uh, that we're monetizing as well. But then uh, there's also going to be uh, the commitment to move forward with um, with phase one. Uh, from the private sector uh, as well. And that's going to be important um, and something that we are, are going to keep our eyes on very carefully um, because we want to ensure that, that is gonna, that's going to take place. And so this is more than, in my mind, it's more than just you know, the placement of a stadium or an arena in a, in a, on a brownfield, um, but it is an entertainment district that, that will encompass uh, far, more than just, far more than just the arena asset itself, but also um, also the phase one developments, uh, the, the, the additional um, revenue and, and, and that, that Kendall was talking about, but then also it, 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 the expectation is that it's going to um, springboard those future phases um, that are far more, um, more, more lucrative to the city um, than, than what we expect to take place here uh, without this uh, catalyst. Yeah. And, and Jimmy, I'd, I would just add one other thing that is a bit unique to the arena as well. Uh, just the significant amount of event related revenue here, given there are really two professional sports teams moving into one arena. So <clears throat> while having a venue booked for a certain number of days might not be unique, having it booked for two professional sports teams it's not all that common across the country. So it just underlines the 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 magnitude of of some of those event specific revenues that we'd hit on earlier. Thank you, Ty. 
Um, so I have some questions about, um, and and I will um, I will assist the panelists if they don't um, know all of the, all of this. But they, we have some questions about the authority structure and sort of what protections will Alexandrians have in in having this new entity kind of overseeing the development and the finances of what is obviously very complicated. Um, and I, I know that Jimmy and Ty both know a lot about other authorities in, in the Commonwealth um, and can maybe maybe talk a little bit about you know, a, a more general approach. Um, I will say for, for the community, um, we are expecting some more information about how the authority, uh, the, the enabling language um, to, to be able to share actually over the next few days. There is some language um, that is available in the governor's budget that, that gives a framework and an outline of how author an authority like this would be structured. Um, but Jimmy or Ty, any um, words that you can share about uh, how these authorities are structured and the protections then that are in place for the community? Yeah, I think the the a couple things. Um, one, it's going it is going to be a state authority um, formed by the General Assembly. Um, you know, the, the the makeup of those of, of it is maybe still in flux, and, and ultimately that'll be a, a decision that the General Assembly makes. But I would expect that it would have um, it would have input and and members of that board be of the appointed by the Commonwealth and appointed by uh, appointed by the city. So there will be some continuity between um the city and the commonwealth as to who sits on that board i think the other thing that i'll i'll say is um the the authority um in and of itself does not have the 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 power and the ability to to really take on this project without the city and the commonwealth uh, making agreements on on funding of it so um the authority's uh funding is from the the city and um and the Commonwealth, this, and let's just talk about the city uh, because that's what's important here. Um, the city will be entering into agreements um, uh, that that provide uh, and and transfer potentially these, these monies over to the authority to pay this pay this debt service. Uh, and with that, the city will be able to um, negotiate and come to terms that make them comfortable on how those monies are spent. Um, and the utilization of, of future tax dollars uh, to pay that debt service um, and how the how the the, the arena is run. Um, so um, not that not that um, we want to get into running an arena, but there certainly there certainly would and should be some um, some ties between the city's ability to fund the, the arena and then what goes on in the arena. Well. Jimmy, you, you might also just hit on at a, at a very high level, um, just with the authority issuing the bonds that there is a potential advantage on some of the debt being tax exempt, right? And that just helps lower the interest rate on the debt service payments. Yeah, that's right. I mean, a big, a big part of what has been looked at is the ability to finance a, a, a large portion of, of this project on a tax exempt basis, the, the, uh, the establishment of the, the sports and uh, entertainment authority is one that can issue tax exempt debt, um, but the Commonwealth and the, the city have engaged um, tax council um, to look at that very carefully. So um, how that's structured and the, the, um, the, the way that the authority has to operate will, will be dictated in particular if we wanna take advantage of the, the ability to issue tax exempt bonds. And that just allows us to borrow at a lower rate um, uh, as well. So that's, that, that's right, Ty, that's, a, that's a, absolutely a positive. Uh, so there are some questions here about how um, a project that is unique like this likely comes with some unique costs for the city, specifically around transportation and around safety. And there's a question about whether we took into account kind of those additional fiscal costs when we evaluate this. And does does our economic impact, um, does it assume that we it's just the same level of service that we provide now, or did we did we make assumptions about those additional costs? We absolutely. Uh, that was part of the modeling that was done to look at um, kind of holistically what what does it take to um, have something like this, where all the impacts going to be. That's all part of what's going to still be um, kind of fleshed out. But absolutely, over the past. Um, all the conversations have centered on not just the revenue side, 
but what is the expense associated with something like this and ensuring that the project would cover that also. Great. Uh, well, while I have you, Kendall, there are some questions here. People want to know, um, with all this new revenue, uh, when will their real estate tax rate be reduced? So that's a great question. Um, something to think about anytime we think about the real estate tax rate, any penny on our real estate tax rate is worth about $5 million. And so any time that we can generate $5 million, whether it is through savings, um, whether it's from getting a grant to do a project in the CIP, or whether it's new revenue, anytime we can generate $5 million, that's the equivalent of a penny on the tax rate. And so if you think about it the other way, if, if we need to generate $5 million, real estate taxes provide about 60% of our revenue sets. So that's, that's really our only source. And so when we can generate multiples of $5 million, it helps us reduce our reliance on the real estate tax rate. I know that you, the city manager, um, ultimately get to set the tax rate. You um, you put together incredible budgets and suggestions, but the tax rate is um, solely set by our elected body um, every single year. Um, so there's um, there have also been a couple questions about um, how how do we pay for something like this while it's under construction. Um, and maybe getting a little bit into the design of bonds. Uh, again, this is something right that the that the city and and um, people who issue bonds deal with all the time. But Jimmy, could you explain how the project gets funded before it actually starts generating revenue? Yeah, yep. No, that's great. That's a great question. Um, you know, uh, any any project revenue uh, type of transaction, you've got to address that that question because again, you know that you're you're. Fundamental point is a, is a great one, and that is if you're going to use the revenues to pay for the debt, well, how do you pay for the debt until uh, those projects are up and running, and you're getting the admission tax and the and the parking and and other uh, other revenues? Well, we we are are going to fund what's called capitalized interest, um, so we are going to uh, borrow in in addition for the project funding, we're going to borrow uh, funds to pay interest during construction of the project. Um, and then obviously there's, they'll, we'll, we'll add some cushion to that as well. You don't wanna go right to the projected uh, completion date. So um, they will, the, the, the principal and interest amortization uh, combined won't begin until after the projected completion date. Um, and again, the ability then to, to generate the revenues, have them come in and, and pay the debt service. But prior to that would be interest only and it would be funded by, uh, by the capitalized interest that is borrowed along with the project funds. Um, well, I'm just, I was just doing a quick peruse here. I, it looks to me like we have covered uh, the major finance and economic impact questions that have been submitted. Um, as I said at the, the beginning, we uh, are able to capture everything that has been submitted both here uh, live and also before tonight's event started, and we are going to be putting them down into writing and being able to submit written answers to all of your questions. I want to pause here and thank our panelists. Uh, thank you for doing this first listening session, and um, thank you to our listeners, both City Manager and Monica Dixon. Um, I am sure that tonight's session will We'll also prompt more questions as people sleep on it um, and, and learn more over uh, the coming days and weeks. I wanted to highlight a couple of other engagement opportunities just in the next week. First of all, remind everyone that we do have a project website, monumentalalx.com, and that is where we are posting, we will be posting follow-up information from this session. We will also be posting uh, any new engagement opportunities. And then certainly as information comes through the General Assembly process that is uh, started last week, uh, we will that will be our main kind of it, it place for you to go to get the latest. But also next week, there are three other things that you can plug into or attend. We When we announced the engagement strategy and schedule uh, just two weeks ago, we said that at every legislative meeting, the city manager and some collection of us would, would give timely updates. And so there's a the second city council legislative meeting is next week. And so there will be a general project update as part of that meeting. 
We're going to have our second listening session. So this format, same time next week, we will be focusing on schools, housing, and community benefit that will be generated and created by uh, this project. And then next weekend uh, on the 27th, the city council will be holding a town hall style session where council members will answer questions and address comments that have been submitted prior to the event. This is a format that they have done now a few times um, on other topics and I think just in general, but this town hall is specifically for this project. And so that will be not this, uh, not this weekend in two days, but the following weekend on January 27th. And in the meantime, we would encourage those who have more questions or um, want to submit comments to continue to use the form that's now on the monumentalalx.com website. And uh, we appreciate everyone's attendance tonight and we appreciate the great questions and the ability to continue to answer them and explain this opportunity as it continues to come to shape. And so with that, we will wish you a good evening and everyone stay warm and be safe tomorrow with the weather. Thank, Thank you. you.